The gospel is about lost people. It's not about prosperity. It's not about healing. It's not about success. The gospel is not even about answered prayer. <laughs> Might surprise you. The gospel is about lost people coming to Jesus. That's all. All other things are like Fiona said, the frills of Christianity. The gospel is about Jesus saving people from sin. And throughout the history of the church, the enemy has mixed things up for Christians. So their energy is dissipated in other useless things rather than in the most important mission that we have on the face of this earth. That is bringing lost people to Christ. Turn in your Bibles, please, to Luke's Gospel, chapter 15. And at the close of this service, we're going to pray for some lost people. Not for the whole world, but the lost people that you know about whom you are concerned about, and your heart is aching for them. You're going to generate some prayer. In the future, I want to see hundreds and thousands of lost people come to Christ. Don't you? That's what the church is about. That's what Jesus is about. That's why Jesus died on the cross of Calvary to bring lost people to God. And Jesus loves lost people. Actually, he loves sinners. Religious people don't like sinners. But Jesus loves them. Jesus hates sin, but he loves the sinner. Luke's Gospel, chapter 15, is one of the most important chapters in the whole New Testament. And the Gospel of Luke is one of the most beautiful Gospels that we can read. And the Gospel of Luke tells us about how Jesus feels about lost people. Jesus told three stories or parables. Parable is an earthly story with a heavenly or spiritual meaning. Talked about the lost sheep, the lost coin and the lost son. You can imagine what was important to Jesus. He takes three stories to talk about one thing. And he said that if you were a shepherd and you had a hundred sheep and one of them was lost or strayed away, the shepherd would leave the ninety and nine good ones and go after the lost sheep. And then he would get a hold of that lost sheep, put it on his shoulder, and come back rejoicing. Then he talked about the lost coin. What was important to this? Those days, Jewish women, especially married women, would wear a, a chain on their head with 10 coins, 10 drachmas. It was probably supposedly given to the woman by her husband. 
And this is a symbol of marriage, a symbol of, uh, of uh, a union, relationship, love, and so on. And if one of those valuable coins is lost, it's possible that the husband would get really angry. And some husbands, you don't know what they do when they get angry, right? <laughs> and go bonkers. If you're a Christian husband, got the Holy Spirit to help you control yourself. But anyway, all kinds of things happen. Sometimes they divorce their wives because they lost a few coins. So the woman was quite upset because she knew the consequences of losing the coin. Maybe she lost it out of the ten because of her carelessness. What did she do? She lit a lamp and she looked all over because in those days they didn't have any light, electricity. Edison wasn't yet born. So she lit the lamp and she looked all over the place in the dark places, the crevices, to find the lost coin and she found it. And she got very, very excited about it. And she, she called all her friends and her neighbors. And they had a big party because she found the lost coin. This is not talking about losing money. <laughs> it's talking in symbolic terms about a person who has strayed away from God and is lost. The lost sheep straight away probably because of its own folly. The Bible likens us to sheep. Sheep are dumb. Sheep get easily deceived. Sheep stray away. And the sheep strayed away because of its own folly. When Jesus talked about the lost coin, the coin was lost because of the carelessness of the caretaker. Sometimes people go astray because people like us and leaders like you and all of us, all Christian family members, are careless. They say unkind things. They behave in wrong ways. Leaders are ruthless sometimes. Even Christian leaders. And so people go astray because of that. I don't know how many people I've met who say they'll never go to a church anymore because of some bad experience they had. Now on the day of judgment, that's not going to fly because each one of us has to give an account of ourselves before God. So you can't say, Joe Blow spoke rudely to me, therefore I walked away from the Lord. That's not going to hold water before God. But anyway, none of us would want to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and be told that we are responsible in some way, even fractionally, for somebody going astray. Isn't it so? Am I right? I'm going to ask you to do a little exercise. We have several people here with small pieces of paper. While I'm speaking to you, you can put it into your smartphone if you want, but better if you have it in a piece of paper. Write the names of people you remember, maybe your loved ones who don't know the Lord, or somebody who's prayed away that your heart is aching for. It's just for you. I'm not going to ask you to put it into a box or anything. It's just for you. You know, while I'm speaking to you, the Holy Spirit will remind you, just write the name down. People may be here or abroad, it doesn't matter. If they are alive somewhere on the planet, and your heart is aching for them, write that name. God is going to work in their lives. Then Jesus talked about the lost son. A father had two sons. And the younger said, give me what belongs to me. Actually, the son, when he said that, he put the father into an economic problem. Because according to the law, the younger son was entitled to one-third of all that the father owned. And in order to give the one-third, usually that one-third came to the son after the father died. In order to give that one-third to the son, the father might have had to sell part of his assets, turn it into cash. 
because this guy wanted cash. And so the father went through that difficulty, but it didn't stop him because God has given each one of us a free will. We have choice, moral choice. We have the capability to make our own decisions. We are different from the animal kingdom. We can decide to be with God or we can decide to be against God. You can't be neutral on this. If you're not with the Lord, you're automatically against him. You're on the other side. You, your heart may not be having hostility towards God, but you're on the other side. There is absolutely no neutral ground. So, the son took the money and he went into a far country and he lived riotously. He wasted his money. He lived his own way. Some people stray away from God because they are rebellious. Unlike the lost sheep who just is careless and goes away, or the lost coin, which is due to the carelessness of people who are supposed to take care of you, but there are many people who are away from God because they don't want to have God to have anything to do with them. They want to live independently, autonomously. They are lost. They may be good people, rich people, educated people. It doesn't matter. Lost people are not always miserable. We sometimes think lost people are always unhappy. No. Many lost people, self-sufficient people are very happy with themselves and they think we are the kooks. They think we are miserable and we are not enjoying life. Many lost people are quite happy with themselves. They are successful. They make money hand over foot. They are not having sleepless nights. They are not sick. They are okay. And in this story, the lost people were the Pharisees, the elites of society, and the scribes, the intelligentsia, of the society. They were the lost people. They were the sinners. Jesus called them sinners. They didn't call themselves sinners. They called other people sinners. And so the son went and lived riotously, but he discovered at the end of the day that his riotous living was not giving him what he really wanted. And his life was a pit. Now that's a reality. Even though you may be a successful person, even though you may be a very intelligent person, no matter what you may be, if you are away from God, actually, your end state, your eternal state, is going to be one of absolute misery. That's why Jesus came to save us and to find lost people. Are you getting some names now? All right, write them down. So after a while, the son came to his senses. And then he returned home. Because he thought to himself, the butler in my father's house is much better off than me. I'm just feeding on pig's food. Actually, even if you're a successful person and you have everything under control, you're living riotously and away from God. You're feeding on pig's food. It's going to catch up on you one day, if not in time, in eternity. When he came back, the father, he was looking, and that's a picture of God. The father was on the balcony. He was watching. All this time, he was waiting for this lost son to return home. Watching all the time. He didn't know where he had gone. He was waiting and watching for the day that his son would return. And one day in the distant horizon, he saw. How could he tell that it was his son? He didn't have glasses. He didn't have bifocals. He didn't have trifocals. He had no glasses. But he looked at the distant horizon and he could tell by the gate probably the way the son walked 
this is my son. Isn't that wonderful? God knows us. He knows by your gait who you are. <laughs> knows everything about you. You don't know God, but he knows you. He knows your constitution. He knows what you're going through. He knows your heart. He knows your structure. He knows everything about you. God is omniscient. And when he saw his son in the distant horizon, he got down and he ran. Now, it is not customary for older people and for upper class people, this man is a wealthy man, to run. This is not Jewish to do that. You don't run to anybody, they run to you. But Jesus told this story very graphically. He said, the father ran. It is something out of character because of his compassion. He went out of his system, what he understood normally, and he ran. Well, it's a picture of the incarnation. God stepped out of heaven in the person of Jesus Christ, and he came down to earth. God should not come down. God should not run. But God did it. That's why we see this here. Jesus praying in the garden of Gethsemane. He knew what the cross held for him. Jesus came down. The Father's love. And then what did he do? This guy was filthy, dirty. He needed a gallon of cologne. He was stinking, but the father hugged him, kissed him, and welcomed him home. You know, Jesus doesn't care what our sins are. He cares for us. He hates our sin, but he loves us. Don't look down on the lost just love them. Telling a person who is a alcoholic or a drug addict to stop doing that doesn't save them. <laughs> a man or a woman who is addicted to something, and you tell them and scold them about it and tell them, stop doing that, stop doing that, even if they stop it, is that going to save them? Only the blood of Jesus saves. So there's no trying, point trying to reform people. They need to be transformed by the blood of Jesus, regenerated by the work of the Holy Spirit in their lives. Don't look down on the lost, just love them. Love them into the kingdom. And so Jesus tells us his story because he wants us to love the lost and go after them. And in these three stories, this is how it starts, chapter 15. Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. Here is the perfect sinless one and the sinners loved him. Amazing. Because even though he was so holy, he loved the lost. He hated the sin, but he loved the lost. And the Pharisees and scribes, Pharisees, the elites, scribes, the intellectuals, complained, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. So he spoke this parable to them so that the religious people and others would understand that Jesus loves the, loves the, loves the lost and loves the sinner. The word lost is used here seven times. In verse 4, twice. In verse 6, once. In verse 8, once. In verse 9, once. Then in verse 24, once. And verse 32 once. So you know what Jesus is talking about. Now what does it mean to be lost? Listen carefully. Because what I'm telling you, many people don't like to hear. About what it means to be lost. 
to be lost does not mean that you're a poor person or you're a sick person or you're a jobless person. or you have no goal in life, that is not the meaning of being lost. The meaning of being lost is a person who has no relationship with God, with the living God. You can be a church person and be lost. Did you know that? And you can be a young person raised in the church. Your parents came to know the Lord. They are the first generation Christians. And you've been raised in the environment of the church, but you have never repented of your sins and encountered the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior. You sit in church every Sunday. You could be a lost person. And everything that's said just flies past you. I'll give you a check. If there is no hunger in your heart for the Lord, if you don't desire to read His Word, if you don't want to hear what the Word of God says, regardless of whether you sing in the choir or in the worship team or even lead worship or whatever you do or teach in a Sunday school, it's very possible you are lost. I've led clergymen to the Lord <laughs> after I explained to them what the gospel is. And after the gospel I explained to them, they said, well, according to this, I have never repented of my sins. I was conducting a leadership seminar overseas somewhere and... Uh, all these were Christian leaders. And the next day I was, I, and the last session I talked about repentance and faith and accepting the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and I got onto the plane, a small commuter plane. No, it was not a commuter plane, a small plane, short flight. And there was a vacant seat, free seating, and I sat there. And then I rec recognized a woman. She was at the leadership training. And uh, she told me, she's been a Christian for many years, she said. She said, you know, yesterday, and she's a Christian leader. She came for the conference because she's a leader. She said, you know, yesterday when you were talking about repentance, I realized that I have never repented of my sins. And after your session, I went back to my room, and I knelt by my bed, and I repented of sin for the first time in my life and experienced a new birth. How's that? The church leader. <laughs> Don't get fooled. If you haven't repented and asked forgiveness of sins and Jesus has not saved you, you're not saved. A lost person can be a happy person, contented person, successful person, but they have no relationship with God. A person who's gone astray from God is a person who, who does not give first place to God anymore. Now they are living their own way and their encounter with God is only a memory. They're lost. But that is only the precursor, preamble to what I want to tell you about what it means to be a lost person and what their final destiny is. It really doesn't matter what other people say about hell and so on. You know something? Every religion has a description of hell. Isn't that interesting? We Christians get slammed all the time for talking about hell. But it's, it's strange that Buddhism, Hinduism, and Islam, all three major religions, speak far more descriptively about hell than the Bible does. You ought to go into the text of other religions, and you will see all kinds of of graphic descriptions of what hell is like. The Bible doesn't give us such a description, just gives some uh, minimal information that it is a place of torment and suffering and so on. The worst part about being lost is that if a person is lost, when they die, they will go to the place called hell or Gehenna, which is a place of eternal torment. Because if in this life you don't want God to have anything to do with you, 
you're a perfect candidate for the devil to say, then I'll have you. Because you know what the devil wants to do? He wants to populate hell. God wants to populate heaven. We want to populate heaven. But the devil wants to populate hell. He wants to take as many there as possible. So if in this life, your life is in the hands of the enemy, I don't mean to say that a person could be demon-possessed or, or behave irrationally. But a person who says, there is no God, I don't want God to have anything to do with my life, God stay out of my life, that person is not on God's side, right? You're not on God's side, you're on the other side. And then when you die, what's going to happen? The person who owns you, the devil, is going to drag you to his place. Jesus described it. This is what Jesus said. This is enough for me. Look at what Jesus said. Mark's Gospel, chapter 9, verse 43. This is not a scare tactic. This is, these are the words of Jesus about the eternal state. And today Christians are getting absorbed with so many other things and they are not telling people about Jesus and about how to get saved. They are so hung up on frills rather than on the real thing. We will not get off the real thing at Calvary Church. No matter what pressure comes from where, we'll stick on the straight line and by God's grace keep the main thing the main thing. The main thing is the lostness of humanity, and the main thing is the salvation of sinners. That's the main thing. Everything else comes after that. Verse 43 says, If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. <laughs> it is better for you to enter into life maimed rather than having two hands to go to hell, into the fire, let's read it together, into the fire that shall never be quenched. Did you read that? This, these are the words of Jesus. Into the fire that shall never be quenched. Their worm does not die. That means there is a rotting that the, there, are, there is something that's going on that will keep on going on eternally and the fire is not quenched. So it's better to be one-handed and in heaven than two-handed and be in hell, Jesus said. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame rather than having two feet to be cast into hell into the fire that shall never be quenched. Their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. It's better to go with one leg to heaven than two legs to hell. Not a joke. These are the words of Jesus. Verse 47. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into the hellfire. It's better to be one eye like Cyclops and go to heaven than be two eyes and go to hell. Jesus' words. To be lost, that means that if my father, mother, son, daughter, Mother-in-law, father-in-law, daughter-in-law, son-in-law, my cousin, whoever it may be, my good friend whom I love very much and I invite for all my gatherings. They die without Christ. God does not send anybody to hell. People choose to go there. Look at the logic of it. If a person says, I don't want God in this life. I don't like the feeling when God is close to me. Then that person is saying, if God is close to me, it's a kind of a little bad feeling and it's a kind of a hell. Heaven will be hell for a person who doesn't want God in their life, is it not? 
Again, heaven will be hell for a person who does not want God in their life. You can't stand the presence of God on earth where God is at a distance. How can a person stand the presence, the immediate presence of God in heaven? How can you? You cannot. It does not make sense. You can't say, I don't want God, I don't want God, and then expect to land up there. It doesn't happen that way. That means the people whom we love, who have not experienced the forgiveness of sins, are what? L O S T, lost. They're lost. What do we have to do about it? We do what the Bible says, and Jesus taught us from the parables. The shepherd went looking for the lost sheep. The woman who lost the lost coin, she carefully and diligently searched for the lost coin. And the father from whom the son had strayed, he was waiting because he didn't know where he was, patiently, compassionately, he was waiting. And when there was a, the smallest sign of return and restoration, the father went running after him and fell on his neck and kissed him and welcomed him home. So what does that mean? That means to plead with the lost, to persuade the lost, to pray for the lost, and to celebrate and praise God with the lost when they come home. Oh, I'll tell you this story, then after that, we are going to spend time in prayer for the lost people in our lives, okay? I'm not going to ask you to pray for the whole of Sri Lanka or, or India or anything like that. We're going to pray for the lost people in our world. The lost people in our world are the names that you are writing right now. I want to show you how God can help you when you go after the lost. Many years ago, before I went to the States for the first time, this is in the 60s, I had worked on a friend of mine who was an alcoholic, and I used to visit him often. He lived close to our place, and I led him to the Lord. He was so, he was so damaged due to his alcohol that he couldn't even hold a piece of paper to work in the bank, and his hand, I go see him in the bank, his hand would be shivering like this. He came to know the Lord, and uh, he was okay. After a while, he got transferred to another city, far, far away from Colombo. And uh, then I heard that he had backslidden, and they had gone back to his drinking. And so happened that we were going to have some meetings, evangelistic meetings in that city. And I took the train and went to that city far away. I had one goal, and that is to find this friend of mine. I didn't know where he lived. I knew he was in that city. I didn't know where, what house, where. No address, nothing. I had lost contact with him. It pays to go after lost people. Because if there's one mission on which the Holy Spirit is with you, it's that. You can be sure, guaranteed. You don't have to pray about it. I landed in the city. And how to go after him, I just asked people, do you know where, let's call him John, do you know where John lives? And then somebody told me, oh, he, he lives somewhere there, down that street, I think uh, that's where he lives. So that day, we were going to have a meeting in the evening in the school hall. I just went. And I walked down that street. And I turned into a house. And lo and behold, here was John, seated in the veranda, but he was soaked. You know what I mean? He had drunk enough to sink a battleship. And he could hardly recognize me. You know, seated there like this. And I walked up, and as I walked close to him, he recognized me, and he tried to get up. I talked to him, and I told him, John, I told him why I'd come. I told him, we're having a meeting this evening. Please come. John came for the meeting. I preached that night. I gave the altar call. 
the first guy to put his hand up was John. <laughs> Led him to the Lord. He got a job with a Ford Motor Company in Canada, in Vancouver, and he went off there. After a while, he gave up his job at the Ford Motor Company, and he became a preacher. He's a pastor. Right now, he's dying. He's hanging between life and death, but he has pastored many churches. You may talk to somebody and lead them to the Lord. You don't know what God's plan is for them. We want to pray for the lost. How about you? On all of you who have those pieces of paper, names, come here. Let's pray together. Let's pray that our altars will be filled with sinners who cry out to God in repentance. And the lost people will come to Christ. Come forward, please. Don't leave. Just come here. I'm so proud of you. This shows what a heart you have for God. Come forward. Let's cry to God. Let's ask the Lord to touch your dads and moms and your, your children and your relatives who don't know Jesus. Let's ask the Lord. Come, come. Let's cry out to God. God's going to answer. He's going to touch these lives. He's going to do it. The lost are going to be found in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. And this could, just should be the start. We just want to keep on praying. This is just the start. We don't want to, we don't want to stop from today. We want, I want you to keep that piece of paper in your Bible. Okay? And I want you every time you read the Bible, look at that name and say, Lord, just work. You know what's going to happen? When you pray, their hearts are going to get melted. Your heart is going to be filled with compassion. And when your heart is filled with compassion, you're going to open a channel of redemption into their lives. That's the way. I don't know how it works, but it works when you pray, things begin to happen. Isn't it? When you pray, things begin to happen. Yes, God answers prayer. Let's pray right now. Let's pray, every one of us, let's pray for those names. You take that, you mention that name. I'm going to lead you in prayer right now. And I'm going to believe that God is going to touch these lives miraculously. And he's going to give you a way out, okay? Hallelujah. Reach out, take that piece of paper, hold it in your hand, and let's pray all together after me. Dear Lord Jesus, I come to you. I thank you for saving my soul. I thank you for reaching down to me, for cleansing me, for forgiving me, for delivering me from my wretchedness into a life of peace and hope and salvation. Lord, I lift up my loved ones to you. They are lost. I do not want them to burn in hell. I want them to come to heaven. I don't want them to be lost. Lord, I cry out to you. May your Holy Spirit work upon them and give me grace, oh God. Well, right now I want to tell you that there are some of you who, if you ask forgiveness for some fractured relationship that you had with some people, God is going to open the door for you. Maybe you had some land dispute or some other relational problem. You don't talk to them anymore or don't uh, have much to do. The Lord wants you to go to them and say, look, I'm sorry. You may not be at fault, but just go and, and put things right. And when you do that, their heart will open. That's going to happen. <clears throat> Lord, I just pray that you will give me grace to put things right so that their soul may be saved. Dear Lord Jesus, help me, I pray. Thank you, Jesus, for hearing my prayer. Now grab somebody else, man to man, woman to woman right now and just pray for the other person. Do that right now. Do that just for a few minutes. Do that right now. Man to man, woman to woman. Come on. Do that right now. Wherever you are, pray for the person who is for, with you right now. And lay your hand upon that piece of paper and pray that there be deliverance in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Let's just pray right now in Jesus' name. Just do that right now. Now receive the blessing of the Lord. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the throne of his glory 
with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you. God bless you and be with you.